Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu Wassalam. Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu Wassalam, Rasulillah, Walaih Sahih Ujma'in. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam al-Awwalin. Wa salli lahum wa salli mubarak ala Habibina wa Nabiyina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam al-Akhirin. Allahumma salli wa salli ala Habibina wa Nabiyina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam al-Lamma dhaqwa fi dhaqwa fi dhaqwa fi all praise due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows what we reveal and knows what we conceal and even knows what the animals feel. We thank him, we praise him, and on him we have reliance. That is to him we turn to for true guidance. We ask him to send his peace, his blessings, his mercy on the best of human beings and prophets, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, on whom be praised until the very end of our days. And we ask him for steadfastness, guidance, mercy, and to never lead us astray and for him to save us on judgment day. So today we're going to be starting um, a commentary or uh, just reading even itself is beneficial uh, and commentary of one of my favorite books um, and that is Sayyid al-Khatir by Imam Ibn al-Jawzi uh, here referred to as Capture of Thoughts by Imam Ibn al-Jawzi as you can see it's a fairly thick book it has 360 chapters in this particular version or edition um, and this is translated by Dar al-Sunnah uh, and inshallah what we'll do is we'll, we'll be reading uh, it together and all, like normal, we'll be doing commentary in Shalazar. Uh, we already covered the um, biography of Imam Ibn al-Jawzi, so we'll just go ahead and get started. So, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, Salatu Wassalam, Wa Rasulillah, Wa Rasulillah, Wa Rasulillah, Imam Ibn al-Jawzi, Rahimahullah, he says, with the name of Allah, the All-Merciful, the Most Merciful. Bismillah, Rahimahullah, Rahim. Sheikh Jamal al-Din, Abdurrahman Ibn al-Jawzi. So, his name is Abdurrahman Ibn al-Jawzi. Uh, he said, all praise due to Allah until he is pleased. May his absolute eternal peace and blessings be on the most esteemed prophet whom he favored over all creation. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon all of his companions and supporters. Our thoughts are apt to roam while exploring different things. Yet, there are, yet after such thoughts tend to be forgotten easily. Therefore, preserving one's thoughts should take priority over everything else in order to prevent them from escaping the mind. It was reported that the Prophet ﷺ said, write down knowledge. And it's narrated in Al-Hakim in his Mustadr. And he said, I had many thoughts that I did not record. And due to my preoccupation were forgotten, which makes me grieve. Subhanallah, this is already a beautiful beginning. The whole um, pre, uh, you know, premise of the book is called Sayyid al-Khatir. Uh, Sayyid is, is like captured, it comes from the word, you know, to hunt, right? And Sayyid here refers to uh, like a thing that you seek and that you look forward to capturing, right? It's a, it's a hunt of, of, of fruit, fruit uh, that there's um, beneficial uh, capturing in that particular hunt. And he said, nothing is, wor is, is better to capture than one's, one's thoughts or to, or to find uh, a thought or a benefit or a wisdom uh, than to capture. Uh, and that's why he called it Sayyid al-Khatir because, you know, you have Khatir uh, is among the five levels of thinking. So uh, you have five levels of thinking. Uh, and uh, this is this is mentioned by a, a number of scholars in uh, a poetry uh, of the five uh, levels of thought. Okay, and I will repeat it to you, inshallah. The five levels of thought uh, are as follows. Number one, hajis. Hajis. Okay, uh, and they, they recited it in a poetry as follows. Maratibu al-qasti khamsun hajisun dhakaru fakhathirun fahadithun nafsi fastami'a yalihi hammun fa'azmun kullahu kullaha yalihi hammun fa'azmun kullaha rufi'at siwa al-akhiri fafihi al-akhdu qad waqa'a and these are the, the five levels, which are, number one, uh, hajis, hajis, okay? Number two, khatir, khatir. Number three, hadithun nafs, hadithun nafs. 
Okay. Number four. Azm. Number four is Azm. One moment, please. Okay. So I'm gonna just number four is Azm. Uh, excuse me. Number four is ham. Number four is 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 ham. And number five is azm. So again, one more time. Number one is hajis. Number two is khatir. Number three is hadithun nafs. Number four is ham. And number five is azm. Okay. So what are the differences with all, with all of this? I will tell you. As of now, uh, as for number, for number one, Hajis. Okay, Hajis is that initial thought that comes to you. The initial thought that comes to you is called Hajis. Okay, uh, it's it's when that initial they call it Surah to Shay Waqa Fi the like the 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 idea, the thought was pictured in your mind, okay? It came to your mind, okay? Khatir is, if a, if a person does not speak about it, huh? and this picture in the mind becomes more clear, right? It becomes more clear. It's not the initial thought. It's just now it's something that becomes more clear in the mind. And there's a, a there's a thought that uh, develops. That's called khatir. So the initial passing thought is called hajis. And the uh, thought when it develops and you and, and it's clear in the mind, that is called khatir. So subhanAllah, the, the, the Arabs they, they made a clear difference. The passing thought is called hajis, and the thought that's become clear is khatir and that's what imam ibn al jawzi is referring to here number three is hadith al-nafs hadith al-nafs is a person who does not speak about the idea but it, it, they constantly re like repeating it within their mind hadith al-nafs is uh, like internal speech that's exactly what it, spoke, what it says okay and they're wondering whether they should do it or they should not do it and this internal conversation, if you actually internal speech or internal conversation is a good good uh, translation, it's called hadith and nafs. Okay. And then, uh, if a person's inclination goes towards one or the other, that's called ham. Aham abiha, right? You are inclined towards one or the other. That's called ham. And then azm is the firm intention uh, that a person will act. And then they used to say, فَمَا بَعْدَ الْهَمِّ uh, فَمَا بَعْدَ الْعَزْمِ إِلَّا الْفِعْ And there's no, uh, there's nothing after azm except the action. خلاص, the action occurs. All right. So these are the five levels of, of uh, thought. And you are held responsible for your azm, only the only the fifth one. And that's what the uh, that's what the li line of poetry means. Maratib al qasdi khamsun hajisun dakaru. Okay. The stages of intent. These are called the stages of intent, or the stages of thought. Are five. Hajisun. This the first one they mentioned. They met. They mentioned. Hajisun. They mentioned. فَخَاطِرٌ فَحَدِيثُ النَّفْسِ فَاسْتَمِعَ Then خَاطِر Then حَدِيثُ النَّفْسِ So listen. So listen. That's what it means. 
يليه هم فعزم كلها رفعت يليه هم فعزم كلها رفعت سوى الاخير ففيه الاخذ قد وقع except uh, so يليه هم after that comes هم i mean after hadith al nafs is هم فعزم uh, uh, then عزم is the fifth one كلها رفعت all of these things all of these five uh, levels of intent or five levels of thought all of them are you're not held responsible they're lifted سوى الاخير except the last one what's the last one عزم ففيه الاخذ قد وقع you will be taken hold or taken to account for it and now what is that what is that intending the last level of intent is what you're going to be held accountable for that intent in your heart of doing good or doing evil that intent to do an action this is from the hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam who said that a person will be uh, will intend to do evil and they will not do it so they will get a good reward and a person will intend to do good and they will not be, be able to do it because they forgot or they were prevented from it and they will still be rewarded and this is also from the uh, hadith all of them which refer to that a person will be rewarded continuously for the acts that they used to do and what prevents them is sickness or travel so all of the sunnahs a person was engaged in and so on and so forth Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward them for the fact that they had what? Azm. They had the intent to do it. All right? So that's why it's important to know these five stages of intent. So we understand what are we held accountable for. You are not held accountable for your hajis, your passing thought. Or your khatir, the thought that was, that was clearly ingrained in the mind and there was a, there was a, a developed thought. Khatir could be a developed thought. It would be nice to say that. Uh, or the, the hadith and nafs, the internal conversations in, that you have. Neither is it that, you know, you're leaning towards doing or not doing, whether it be good or bad, but what you're held accountable for is your azm, that intention, firm intention before an action. Okay? So I, I thought that was important for you to understand because that's what the entire book is named after. And then he said, uh, the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu write down knowledge. And that's why they said, that al-ilmu uh, uh, al knowledge is, 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 is something that needs to be hunted. And they said that writing it down is what captures it. So do that often. If you have, like, for example, even for me, um, alhamdulillah now, like Telegram and these kind of things, they allow you to send yourself uh, notes and things like that. So what I do is I have an, just an account for myself. It's only me. I send everything I come across in that account. So that's easily searchable. I can read it. I can go back to it. Because oftentimes what happens if I have a notebook, I may write and I, that notebook might get lost or something. Whereas this is a cloud program. Even if I lose the phone or something, it's still, it's still preserved. So this is a way to, uh, to, and people use like Evernote. They use other things. Do whatever you want. Everybody's different. But this is something that helps me uh, to send uh, to a particular um, uh, account everything articles, uh, wisdoms, a hadith, and then what happens is probably over the course of I think 10 years, uh, I'll be preparing a class. I'll just type Omar ibn Khattab or Abu Bakr or the idea, and uh, I'll search it and I have a whole thing of, of, of references, quotes that I've, that I've preserved in this one area. So it's a beautiful way to, to keep, um, uh, to keep your your notes. Also, one of the things, uh, beautiful things, is in in uh, Windows, for example. I don't know a lot of people know this, but your search um, your search uh, bar in uh, the Start menu. If you type in a word, it actually searches all of your documents for that word. So if I have a lot of the, a lot of books on online, uh, sorry, on my on my computer, I'll just type a, a word, and it'll give me all of these books that are there. And obviously there's, there's other source uh, research engines and things like that. But these are just some things that can capture, capture these thoughts. So he said something, I had many thoughts that I did not record due to preoccupation work. They were forgotten, which makes me grieve. And in reality, that's true. I mean, how many times you, you go, you attend a class, etc., and 
uh, you 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 said that's such an amazing uh, thing. You did not write it down, and it's false is gone. And maybe that would have been a point of motivation for you, that you you know would help you. He continues by saying, "I notice that whenever I open the eyes of contemplation, I see incredible hidden notions and thoughts that never before crossed my mind." And that is why, in reality, contemplation and reflection is one of the greatest, greatest as aspects of worship. Because reflecting on these different aspects well, is what makes, uh, makes them firm in your heart and also allows you to see things that will give you clarity as well as uh, make it ingrained in the, in the mind. He says, I therefore lavish such thoughts with discernment as they are too precious to be overlooked. It is for this reason I authored this book and made it a place where I place all my captured thoughts, Sayyid al-Khatib. Indeed, Allah is the provider of all benefit, and He's ever near Qareeb and answering Mujib. Okay. Um, let's read chapter one. The heart's very insusceptibility to religious exhortations. Person may hear a mawa'id. Uh, exhortations is mawa'id, admonition. So the heart varies in, in its susceptibility to um, admonitions. And it's, I think, acceptance and reflection would be a good word. Or an influential sermon, khutbah, that causes the heart to be awakened. And he uses the word yaqadah. However, as soon as they leave the place of admonition or where the sermon was delivered, the heart returns to a state of qaswa hardness and ghafla heedlessness this being the case i contemplated the reasons behind the quick change of the heart and i was successful in finding the answer i came to realize that the reason for the variation of the effect of admonition and sermons on the heart is because the state of the heart prior to hearing them is different to its state at the time of hearing them and also after hearing them so the the state of the heart is dependent on three aspects, before, during, and after. There are two reasons to explain this variation in the state of the heart and mind. The first of which is the mechanism and effect of admonition and reminders is similar to the effect of whips and lashes on people. <laughs> the skin feels pain only when it is whipped, but pain evaporates afterwards. Meaning what? A person can become accustomed to pain. So they start becoming accustomed to the admonition reminders. And that's why I'm not a fan at all of these YouTube videos, which are constantly very, very uh, emotionally oriented, uh, or they're, they're supposed to be like these strong reminders that are like, because why? You become, you become, you know, used to them, acclimated to them, and then they start losing their effect. So when you hear of something like, oh yeah, I've heard that before. Or not only that, you were moved by it already. You cried at this one video of a person, you know, describing uh, death and so on and so forth, or the day of judgment. So guess what? It doesn't have an effect on you in your heart anymore. And that's why, look, Anas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, uh, he would say, the Prophet said, he would choose his reminders very, very carefully. And it wouldn't just be every single time. It would be once in a while. So this is important, this aspect of, you know, if you go, I'm not joking with you, go to YouTube, uh, and the channels that are run by Muslims, you know, I'm not going to mention them, you know them, and just look down the playlist, death, jinn, the day of judgment, like these very sensational, emotional like tags, and it's all clickbait. So you can click on it and you listen to it. And if you notice, a lot of these videos that are clickbait, what are they doing? They're trying to capture your heart and your emotions high and low, high and low. It's like you're being whipped and lashed, like you remember what Josie says. And what happens? After a while, a person becomes desensitized. And that's why it's not good to get your uh, faith from emotional, sensational videos. Constantly watching this desensitizes you and, your, and, and numbs your heart. So the best thing to do is to watch and listen to substance. Substance means a series about tafsir, a series on the life of the Prophet ﷺ, an explanation of hadith like we're doing now. Why? Because it's giving you dosages here, right? It's giving you 
uh, knowledge that is appropriate. And then when there is a moment of, of, of emotional discussion, of it's giving it to you at its appropriate time. Whereas if you're listening, the only thing that you're used to, what happens? You become actually um, very annoyed very easily and you can't focus. Your focus is off. Why? Because these videos and these uh, YouTube channels, they doctor, they doctor the uh, video. So it's, it's, it's a five minute emotional like, you know, moment. They even, for example, in an hour lecture by a speaker, they'll only choose the moments which are extremely highly emotional. It's like a drug in that sense. And I call it, he calls it whip and lash. I call it Molotov cocktail of Iman. You know, Molotov cocktail, what happens? You light it up, you throw it, and then it starts a huge burn, but it, that's it. it, it bur when, the, when the fire burns, off, it's over. And that's how people's faith are, uh, faith is. It either goes up very high and then it goes down, up and down. So what are you doing? Throwing Molotov cocktails of Iman at people. And this is not good. This is not good. We should grow our faith and develop it steadily. And that's important to attend classes of substance. Don't be so used to keep watching these videos. Oh, so great. Such a great video. And that the person who was lecturing was an hour and a half long, but they picked the five minutes, which was the most emotional. This is not right. This is not good. Okay. So it, it evaporates afterwards. The second reason is, he says, that both the mind and the heart at the time of hearing admonitions and sermons are detached from all worldly distractions. Hence, the heart listens attentively. However, as soon as they return back to their normal life, their worldly life absorbs their time. Due to that, they're, they're unlikely to remain in the same condition while listening to the sermon or the admonition. So this is, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful statement. When you're living your normal day-to-day -day life, these are the distractions of the world that, are, that, that our hearts are attached to. And then what happens is when we're listening to an admonition, all of a sudden we turn the iman on, right? The faith turns on and we become engaged with it. And then when we're, when we're not listening to it, it becomes, it turns off. But the best notion is that it doesn't turn off. It becomes less. It's like a, you know, those uh, lights which have um, a, a sensitivity. If it goes high and low, rather than on and off, it just lowers in sensitivity. So there's less light. There's less effect. But there's still an effect. Don't be a person where your your faith is on off, on when I'm in the masjid, I'm on when I'm in a class, off when I'm dealing with the world. That's not that's not healthy, and that is not actually. Uh, uh, you won't find benefit. It'll just be moments. So faith are not moments. Faith is continuous. And that's why this sensitivity will go up and down, right? The light will go, will, will be, will, will shine when you're, when you're reflecting, but it should still remain when you're dealing with the world. So it's, it's, it's a very powerful uh, example that he's been giving. He continued by saying the vast majority of people are exposed to this kind of effect where the heedless ones are affected differently when they're exposed to admonitions. There's a group of people who are determined without having hesitation and proceed without a second thought. They become in a state of discomfort when their intrinsic nature stands in the way. This was the case of the companion, Alhamdulillah, who admonished himself by saying, I became a hypocrite. Alhamdulillah says, I became a hypocrite. Meaning what? The story that, that is mentioned, um, is uh, narrated as a Muslim that Hanzala was among the scribes of Allah's Messenger, meaning mean, the ones who used to write the revelation when the Prophet would recite it to them. He said, I met Abu Bakr. He asked, uh, So he asked me, Who are you? I replied, Hanzala. And he said, Hanzala, I have become a hypocrite. So Abu Bakr became startled. He said, SubhanAllah, glory be to Allah. Why do you say such a thing? And Hamdala said, because whenever I'm with, in the company of Allah's Messenger, وسلم, I reflect over hellfire and paradise as if I see them with my own eyes. And when I'm away from Allah's Messenger وسلم, and return to my wife, my children, my business, most of these things that pertain to the hereafter, they leave my mind. I, uh, that's what he, he said. I answered this to Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr said, I swear by Allah, I feel the same way. So I and Abu Bakr went to Allah's Messenger وسلم, and said to him, O Messenger of Allah, Hanzala has become hypocrite. 
So the Prophet Sallallahu said, what has happened to you? And I, he said, I said, oh Allah's Messenger, when I'm in your company, I reminded of hell and hell, a hell and paradise, as if I see them with my own eyes, but whenever I go away from you and attend my wife and children business, much of these things go out of my mind. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, if you were to be in the same state, meaning your, your, your faith is always high, in my, uh, that you achieve in my presence, angels would Greet, uh, d would basically descend and greet you, what, or give salam to you while you're sitting in the streets. Meaning what? You would, you would be such an, in a high state of faith that you're at the level of angels, right? And the level of angels, meaning like you have no absolute, no, no free will. You don't commit mistakes. You don't do anything. And he said, oh, alhamdulillah, but rather sa'atun wa sa'a. A time that you will be dealing with your worldly affairs and another time where you contemplate on the hereafter, but that doesn't mean that, okay, turn on and off. What it means that there will be a time where your faith will, 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 will be less than, than you with the Prophet Muhammad So of course, that, that, that's obvious going to be the case. And he finishes it off by saying, on the other hand, there are some people whose nature sometimes inclines them to ghafla. And such admonitions entice them to sometimes act on it they become like a tuft in the path of a wind, like wherever the wind blows. Tuft meaning like a piece of cotton. Just throw it, and wherever the wind is, is blowing, that's where they are. Instead of being firm, the wind is coming, it doesn't matter. The winds of, of desire, the winds of let's, let's go do this, let's go do that. They're like, I'm, you know, I'm good. I mean, you don't, you're not affected. With other people, the effect of reminders and admonitions on them vanishes by, by the time they finish hearing them. Similar to how much time water would remain on a smoothened rock. Meaning what? It doesn't affect them. It just passes. It goes one ear out the other. He says these are the three types of people. People like Handala, who were so in tune with the admonition that it actually had an impact on them even after it was done. And they were like, I'm a hypocrite. Well, the Prophet corrected that. He said, you can't, you know, you can't. You can't have the same level of faith constantly. So the Prophet corrected that. And then there's people that their ghafla, their heedlessness, makes it so that the effect of the admonition uh, ceases after they listen to it. So that it was only at the time of listening. And then afterward, back to heedlessness. And the last of which, the admonition on them while they're listening and afterwards like pouring water on a smooth rock. How much of the water stays? Almost none. Just like sliding off. Comes on off. May Allah subhanahu wa make us of the first and help us to overcome being from the second and protect us from being the third. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.